Jorge, I would like to, to add to, to Harry's comment uh, a quite important fact that I, I experienced in, in my practice and at some point during the last year is the fact that, as he just said, the, the importance of doing a bone marrow diagnosis, right? There is a, well, with the introduction of PCR, there is a trend to, to use PCR alone as a mm, diagnosis of this entity. And, and in fact, I have like a, anecdotal cases where there have been patients diagnosed with a false positive PCR low levels, where in fact they were not having any problem in the bone marrow with cytogenetics. So I think it's, it's, it's quite uh, important. I want to emphasize the, the importance to do a baseline uh, bone marrow assessment to really have a, a truly and, and faithful, a good diagnosis of this entity. Right, and it also gives you the bone marrow diagnosis might give you some hint if the patient's already slipping into an accelerated phase, if Absolutely. you see fibrosis Absolutely. and clustering of blasts. Absolutely. Many, many Do things. It doesn't many, happen many that things. often, but it does happen. Yeah. Or if they have clonal evolution, you Absolutely. may not be able to do cytogenetics on the peripheral blood at diagnosis. Yeah, so if they have clonal evolution, you might say, well, so what? Well, you might pick change, a different dose of your therapy. able TKI mm -hmm. up front. So unusual situations, but I guess those are the things that we see, you know, referred into us are these patients who don't quite fit with what you would, might normal. expect. So, so, so Javier brought up the issue of the bone marrow. So, so David, can I ask you how often baseline, um, I, I think it is, I, I fully agree that, that baseline bone marrow is, is, is to me mandatory. Um, after the diagnosis, do you do bone marrows? How often do you do bone marrows? Do we need bone marrows? Um, when? Right. So, um, first of all, I, I agree completely with the importance of, of doing it at, at diagnosis, as, as has been uh, mentioned. Um, you can perhaps underestimate the, the, the degree, the staging of the disease, even uh, just by relying on peripheral blood. Um, you know, I think it's a little controversial about, about uh, how often you need to do a bone marrow biopsy after diagnosis. Um, as, as Kevin mentioned, you might want to do it um, to document uh, complete site genetic remission. There is still value in that endpoint in terms of uh, predicting survival. Um, but, and I, I think the NCCN has kind of struggled a little bit uh, with it. Um, I, I think PCR, of course, has become a very valuable uh, uh, test. and. Um, um, the level of MMR, for example. Uh, to some extent, I think it's, it's uh, taken the place of, of uh, uh, following side genetics and, and doing bone marrow biopsies. Uh, so that, I, I, to me, I, I think it's reasonable if the patient is meeting the molecular uh, endpoints that you're looking for, it's reasonable not to do a bone marrow biopsy uh, again after that initial di diagnosis. Of course, if they fail to reach milestones or if they lose their, their initial response, that, that's another story. But um, uh, I, I think that um, relying on peripheral blood fish, which is another way to document side genetic remission, and that's a little controversial as well about how uh, uh, acceptable that is, but I, I think you can use that and, and the peripheral blood PCRs and, and not have to do more bone marrow biopsies. Actually, Kevin said it earlier that if a patient doesn't have a, a BCR able ratio of uh, less than 1% uh, or, or MMR, that he would do a bone marrow biopsy at, at one year. Oh, yeah. And actually, I think NCCN says that, the, right. that if your patient's in an MMR, or you already know they're in a cytogenetic remission, you don't have yeah. to do a bone marrow right. um, at that point. So, so I, I think most of us have gotten away from many of the follow-up bone marrows right. that we yeah, were doing. Yeah, the follow-up, I, I agree. I, um, one thing that still worries me is that there's a small subset of patients, about 10, 15% of patients that uh, may develop these chromosomal abnormalities yeah. in the Philadelphia negative, negative metaphases. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, of course, that you wouldn't find by a PCR. You wouldn't even find by a fish unless you did a fish for every chromosome. Right. Um, so, do you do you so, do you well, worry about them? Do you look for them? Um, you know how the the best way not to worry about them, Jorge? Uh, Don't do the bone marrow biopsy yeah. because <laughs> what, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, Jorge, I already know from my patients who go to MD Anderson that before they can see you, they get a bone marrow biopsy. So I understand <laughs> that it's mandated. Um, no, the, the, uh, the, the, the issue, um, now I forgot, that was so funny, I forgot what I was going to say. <laughs> Just, you know. But the additional side genetic abnormalities. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, what to do with them, thank yeah. you. We don't know what to, so it's 5 yeah. to 10% of patients will have, a, you know, a pH negative clone that has these cytogenetic changes. And uh, I remember when I sat on the NCCN um, 
uh, committee and um, people around the table brought this up as a reason not as a reason to continue to do the yearly exam. And my argument against it was not only don't we know what to do with it, but there have been patients who have been referred for allogeneic stem cell mm -hmm. transplant based on these clones, which right. may come and right. go over time. Right, right. right. So, so, so maybe well, the best way not to worry. So is I not remember to do the that. paper oh, yeah. that Jorge, Jorge published and, and many others. Right, it's true that maybe only deletion of se uh, chromosome seven on very very few um, situations. I remember was one case or two cases that may also really be um, war give you some warning because you may have an anemia and explain anemia or some kind of uh, prolonged cytopenia. Do you may want to investigate, but for the for the it's overall nice. cases, for the overall cases, I agree that that's oh, something I, I that's mean, different. Let yeah. me tell you my, my approach, and I think it's very compatible with what you all have said. Uh, I do worry about these things because we've shown that their overall survival for all of them is a, a little bit inferior. Uh, but on the other hand, these, these abnormalities tend to happen early on. So I do bone marrow at the beginning. Once they get to a stable MMR, uh, if they haven't developed these abnormalities, it's very rare that they'll develop them later. So I do stop doing bone marrows uh, well, unless there's changes on the counts or some so how many things, you of course. Uh, well, you know, a patient will end up getting maybe a, a, a two or three bone marrows uh, uh, after all uh, scheduled and then, and then only as needed. Um, but I do want to know when they develop these abnormalities because they, they do have a little bit of implication. True. Um, there's no clear indication of what to do with those patients, but those patients I may want to keep a closer eye and, and have a lower threshold for if, when things change because they may be developing occasionally an MDS and, and an AMA. So um, I think that's something that I think we just need to be aware. I think that, that it's, I mean, it is uh, definitely a fact that we are not doing as many bone marrows and we don't need to be doing bone marrows as much. And definitely a patient that has reached a stable MMR uh, bone marrows are, are uh, just as needed uh, based on other yeah. factors. Like if the patient's in a, a good remission and they develop new cytopenias, it shouldn't Absolutely. be assumed it's due to the drug. Correct. Absolutely. Okay. Yes, exactly it, right. You have to worry that it's, it's either losing a response that their disease is moving into a blast crisis or they've got this secondary myelodysplastic syndrome or just keep in mind these patients are living longer and they could develop some other cause of anemia, um, but it has to be evaluated, not just assumed it's the drug and, and, and cut back on the dose of the drug because that's how we handle heme toxicity. It's different when you see it later on. Absolutely. So Javier, let me ask you, uh, you know, we, we, we talked a little bit about the early molecular responses and these 10% threshold and whatever, and then, you know, patients going deeper and we have uh, some guidelines as to how deep they have to go at what time that they, all these NCCN and ELN tell us these values. What happens when you go in the op opposite direction? You're monitoring a patient and there's a change in their, in their transcript levels. You, you have a whatever value and then next time they're a little higher. Sure. When do you start worrying? When is a change just a variation and when is a change a real change? So, so to start with, I will have to really say again that we are using a very, very sensitive techniques that has an intrinsic uh, variability in the fact that you can repeat it and you have different values. And it is something that, that people may not really understand much in the community because we are the ones who, who see these problems more often, right? But there is no doubt that there are several scenarios that we can encounter with these uh, variabilities of the PCR, right? The, the, one of the scenarios that you will mention before is the fact that some patient may really go all the way down to a, almost a complete molecular response and detectable disease and it's not really unusual many times when you see these blips, where you see really detectable disease. And in my opinion, in not, not really should be considered a failure of therapy by any means, rather like a sometimes variability that may be related, adherence, or even uh, biology of the disease, but for, by any means that it really, really have any, any problem. Of course, there is uh, several guidelines about the fact that if a patient has reached this response and lose the major molecular response, the way from 4.5 and all, and then really go to less than 3.5, will be a reason of concern, in my opinion, right? A reason to really say, well, is this patient is, is leading or is going to a, a cytogenetic relapse, and maybe a, a, a time where 
at some point, if really these things continue to be consistent, a bone marrow evaluation will be indicated to really see what's going on, right? So once again, I think the, the variability of the PCR may happen at different levels. I always remember uh, your talks about if the PCR is going well, is the same, leave it alone. <laughs> if, it's, if it's going, uh, it's going down, it's perfect, and it's going up, well, watch more carefully right. so you really, really, um, you really want to anticipate the, the further uh, relapses and the fact that you need to really discuss the possibility to change therapies. I'm glad somebody has listened to my talks. <laughs> <I thought they're laughs> very good. Now, Kevin. Um